Hey guys, Buildzoid from Actually Hardcore Overclocking here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the VRMs on the EVGA X299 Dark Motherboard. And I did specify VRMs because uh, there's so much to talk about on this board that if I actually wanted to cover everything that's on the PCB, this video would be 40 minutes long and nobody would want to watch it. So, let's get to the VRMs, uh, starting with the largest and most important one, the VCC in. Uh, and or vCore. Um, if you're running KB like X, it's vCore. If you're running Sky like X, it's VCC in. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our coffee lake temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds for use on top of the IHS, like Cryonaut and Hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. So the reason why you have this distinction is that Skylake X has a fiber and KB Like X being pretty much just KB Like glued onto a X299 package um, doesn't have a fully uh, doesn't have a fiber. Now the fiber is the fully integrated voltage regulator. Um, this thing exists. It's basically a very low voltage. It's a low voltage uh, DC to DC converter. It's present on the CPU and Intel uses it because. Um, well, let's say you have a 200 watt CPU. Um, well, okay, no, well, sure, 200 watt CPU. And there's kind of two ways you could try deliver that power, right? You could deliver it as two volts and 100 amps, uh, or you could deliver it as one volt, 200 amps. Both of them are still 200 watts. Now, this one is really, really hard on a VRM. And the reason for that is, is because um, power dissipation uh, well, there's more to VRM power dissipation than just this, but very basically, a good chunk of your VRM's power dissipation is conduction losses, and those are expressed as uh, power equals I squared R. So your VRM resistance is kind of fixed, um, well, somewhat fixed. You can get it down, but the, the amount of effort required to make this lower is kind of ridiculous past a certain point, and takes up a lot of physical space. Now... Uh, you have this current component, which, uh, that grows quadratically. So, it's much, much e so, in, you know, with the fiber, you can very easily massively drop the heat output of the VRM by just going from, you know, VRM outputting 1 volt at, uh, 200 amps to VRM outputting 2 volts at 100 amps, and then the VRM doing the, uh, the fully integrated voltage regulator doing that last step of the conversion of going from 2 volts 100 amps to 2 volts, to, uh, to, from 2 volts 100 amps to 1 volt 200 amps. So that final conversion happens on the CPU itself, and your VRM has to just do 12 volts down to 2 volts instead of down to 1 volt and stupid high current, which would produce a lot of heat. So that's why you have VCC in instead of just straight vCore, because the actual vCore is generated on die with uh, Skylake X CPUs, as well as some other voltages, though System Agent and IO are both external. So uh, let's talk about the VCC and VRM we have here. It's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 phase. And that means it uses a doubling scheme because nobody manufactures a 12 phase voltage controller. The con voltage controller here is a ISL uh, 69138. This is a intercell uh, part and intercell are owned by Renesas. So... That's just a little side note. It supports up to seven phases at one megahertz switching frequency. This is a seven phase. It's kind of special because it'll support any phase ca uh, configuration that's uh, X plus Y less than seven. So it could run like here. It's running a six plus one phase with that plus one being this phase right over here. But you could also run it as a four plus three or a, you know, say a five plus one or a 2 plus 1 if you felt like wasting money, uh, because that is an expensive part. Um, so that's the that's the voltage controller running the operation, and it is running six phases here. Now, the PWM signal from that goes into these chips uh, right here. These are the actual doublers, 
And these are also intercell parts, uh, ISL 6617s. These are some of the smartest uh, doubler chips you can get. They support some amount of current balancing, so they won't just let, you know, um, like the most basic doublers essentially just pass a PWM signal between one phase and the other. Um, these things will actually allow you to do things like turn off half, uh, turn off the extra phases if they're not being used. Um, balance current if one phase is pushing significantly more current than the other then it'll actually skip a cycle or extend or shorten a PWM signal for the phase that's uh, that's doing less or more work to get it back into current balance so very very smart doubler this is about as close as you're going to get to having a real 12 phase VRM as is possible um, there's not really any other like there are competing parts that can do the same amount of work, but there's not anything better than this um, out there. So yeah, this this is as good a 12 phase as you're gonna get. Um, and the actual power stage used is also absolutely top of the line intercell componentry. This is an ISL 9922B. These things are $5.5 a piece. For, and that's when you're buying them bulk. Okay, so these are some ridiculously expensive MOSFETs. Um, and that's buying them bulk from like a normal parts supplier like Mauser or uh, DigiKey. I'm not sure if EVGA actually gets like a even better bulk discount on these. But if you're buying a reel of these from Mauser, yeah, you're paying $5.5 a piece. These are really, really expensive power stages. Some competing parts like an International Rectifier 3555 is about $3. So these aren't cheap. Um, and uh, there's a reason for that. These aren't just regular power stages. These are smart power stages and they come with a special casing. So first let's go over the reason why these are considered smart. They integrate current monitoring and temperature monitoring directly into the package. So there's a thermal sensor and a current sensor built into these power stages. Um, so they also integrate protections like overcurrent protection and over temperature protection. Now over temperature protection on these um, is uh, it's very soft. It basically just tells the voltage controller, hey, you might want to shut down the VRM. Uh, we're over 140 degrees centigrade internally. Um, we're probably going to die if we keep running any longer. Um, but that is ultimately like the EVGA can opt to literally just disable that protection from the side of the voltage controller. Now the OCP on these is set at 90 amps and that is hard. If, uh, if any of these phases exceeds 90 amps output, um, it's going to shut down um, that phase and raise a flag for the voltage controller that, hey, you might want to shut down the rest of the VRM because basically if one of those phases hits 90 amps, then... Probably most of them are not far from that, uh, from hitting that amount of current either. And shortly after one of these shutting down, the current load would uh, end up uh, probably like it would push the current load onto the remaining phases, which would probably push the rest of them out of, uh, well, over OCP trip points as well. And then the whole VRM sh would shut down. Um, luckily, uh, you should never actually run into that scenario because this is a 12 phase, and if you're pushing 90 amps per phase, then that's like 180 amps, uh, that's 1,080 amps total, which, uh, the, yeah, the Skylake X is power hungry, but it's not two kilowatts power hungry, because uh, your VCC in will probably be between like 1.8 and 2 point something volts. Uh, 2.6 is considered maximum voltage for LN2. For air cooling and water cooling, you don't want to go over 2.2 volts. In my experience, it doesn't actually, like, it seems, at least the CPU I've been dealing with seems to prefer a lower VCC in rather than a really, really high one. Um, but I'm still in that, like, I'm still pretty close to 2 volts. So, yeah, you don't have to worry about the OCP on these. It is there in case of some kind of catastrophic failure, but you should never ever really hit it. Now, the other cool feature of these is that they have this exposed metal contact, and that is actually hooked directly into the silicon die inside of these MOSFETs, uh, and it massively improves thermal resistance of the packaging. So the internals of these run a lot, lot cooler because they're transferring heat through a bit of metal rather than ceramic or resin, depending on the kind of MOSFET packaging you're dealing with. Some will use ceramic packaging, some will use resin. Um, so here you actually get proper metal 
uh, thermal transfer to the heatsink uh, VRM, the you know the very significant VRM heatsink that EVGA puts on this board. So those are all very nice features that these have. And in terms of actual current capabilities, these are rated for a continuous output of 60 amps, assuming you can handle the heat output. 60 amps, 1.8 volts on one of these produces 12 watts of heat. So you're not going to be pushing 60 amps through, you know, like if you end up in a situation where every single one of these is pushing 60 amps, that VRM is going to be producing a ridiculous amount of heat. Um, however, you should not run into that scenario because for reasonable power outputs, um, say for air-cooled overclocking on Skylake X, you're going to be looking at like 200 to 300 watt power output on the VRM. And I'm doing all of the ratings again with that 1.8 volts output of the VRM and 500 kilohertz switching frequency because, well, the VRM can't actually go over that because you have that one megahertz running through doublers, which will cut down the frequency in half. Even if these are really, really smart, they won't double the, they, they can't produce more frequency out of thin air. Um, well, they can't maintain frequency while maintaining phase interleaving. Um, and phase interleaving is the most efficient way to run a VRM anyway, so it's not like they're going to just pass straight 1 megahertz PWM into the VRM. The other thing is you don't actually get control over the switching frequency, so it's whatever EVGA decides to program and uh, throwing the VRM efficiency out the window for uh, marginal improvements in voltage regulation is probably not something they opted for. So uh, 1.8 volts, 500 kilohertz. Um, air-cooled, you're going to be looking at 200 to 300 watts uh, CPU power consumption and a VRM heat output between 12 and 16 watts. So really not that bad. The ridiculous heat sink that EVGA puts on this board is going to handle that no problem. Now on water cooling, things start to heat up. Um, you can probably push between 300 and 500 watts depending on the workload, overclock and voltages, at which point you're looking at uh, 16 to 30 watts of heat. Um, and now the, you know, now that VRM heatsink that EVGA puts on this board uh, starts actually being useful. Still massive overkill because there are other boards that can sustain this kind of power level. Uh, admittedly, they use the same VRM and a slightly less uh, uh, cooling oriented heatsink, but uh, there are boards that can sustain this. Um, just this thing has the best VRM cooling on a modern motherboard for a while now. So it'll handle this kind of power output, no problem. Now, if we go on liquid nitrogen, uh, things go absolutely insane. We're talking power draw levels from 500 watts into the 1,000 watt range. Um, hot, <laughs> very, very hot. That's what that's going to be. And the end result is that you're going to be looking at VRM thermal outputs of 30 to uh, 96 watts. And, uh, well, that's like a GPU, like that's a low end GPU's worth of, uh, worth of heat output or a reasonably high end CPU worth of heat output. Um, the good news is for the motherboard, uh, that most, you know, most liquid nitrogen workloads that would pull a thousand Watts won't last more than a couple minutes. The other thing to consider is that when the CPU socket is at a minus 100, uh, say, yeah, minus 100 degrees, uh, Skylake X has a pretty high cold boot bug due to the voltage, uh, fully integrated voltage regulator. It doesn't work below minus 100 degrees in most cases. There's some CPUs that go a bit lower, some that go a bit higher. But in most cases, around minus 100 degrees and below that, you're not going to be able to put, like, the, the system's not going to even run. So... For that, uh, you know, with the socket at minus 100, deg uh, minus 100 degrees uh, centigrade, the surrounding area of the CPU socket tends to end up very cold as well. So what you'll find if you're doing any liquid nitrogen overclocking, this entire area of the motherboard, which actually, with this being a 2 dim, um, kind of this area of the motherboard tends to all end up uh, below ambient, with anything really close to the CPU socket actually just being sub-zero. Um, so something like this memory stick, um, I would not be surprised if that ended up at minus five degrees centigrade um, and actually just building up straight ice as it's not that rare for the memory slots to literally freeze over on really long overclocking sessions. So the VRM will actually end up, uh, it won't be like, 
Like if you're normally running your, your system, your VRM will be slightly above ambient temperature. If you're on liquid nitrogen, your VRM will start at a temperature significantly lower than ambient because it's literally the closest thing to the CPU socket. And it also is hooked very heavily into the ground plane and the, co uh, and the power plane, which are both massive copper layers that will, you know, transfer the cold from the CPU socket to the VRM very, very quickly. Um, the flip side to this is, is that the VRM area tends to end up being a puddle as, you know, you go idle and the VRM ends up at minus 5 degrees and then you go full load and the VRM ends up at like plus 50 uh, or plus 70 by the time you finish the benchmark and all of that ice that built up when it was idling is now water, which kind of sucks. Um, so... Yeah, which is why insulating on liquid nitrogen, especially for Skylake X, is like really, really important. Now, a few people might be worried about that power draw figure versus the 8 pins. The good news is uh, a 8 pin on 18 gauge wiring, you can handle uh, 480 watts because uh, these are four 12 volts and four ground connections. They're not like GPU 8 pins, which are three 12 volts and three grounds. Um, so these actually, all the pins in these actually transmit power and each pin pair is good for 10 amps if you have 18 gauge wiring. If you're on 16 gauge wiring, you can push 624 watts per connector, uh, just fine. So you don't actually have to worry, like you don't have to worry about these melting. The cables might get pretty warm if you are, uh, you know, again, running extended loads. That's the other thing. It takes time for things to get hot. So just because you're pushing a thousand watts doesn't mean these connectors are gonna have it like are gonna be at that really high stress level for long enough to cause uh, you know to to start getting really really hot and to the point that it's concerning. So that's the vCore VRM. Let's go cover. I mean VCC in slash vCore VRM. Let's go cover some of the others. The VCCSA VRM right over here, also controlled by the ISL sixty nine one three eight. It's that plus one part of that six plus one. Um, and this is, uh, well, it's a regular old power stage. Um, it's an ISL part again, and this is a 99140. Um, and it's rated for 40 amps continuous output, 15 amps, 500 kilohertz switching frequency. Um, you're going to be looking at about two watts of heat. Um, so, you know, no big deal there. Now, if you look at, so, you know, VCCSA is plenty overkill because this is kind of what you'd be looking at in terms of current draw there. Now, the VCCIO VRM is located down over here. Um, this thing does not actually have a heatsink. This, you know, the VCCSA shares its heatsink with the VCCN VRM. So basically the temperature of this thing is entirely bound to what the, uh, you know, the core power consumption because that's what's really going to change the temperature of that VRM heatsink. Now this thing doesn't actually have a heatsink, which is why it ends up with a stronger power stage, even though it doesn't have to deliver as much, like it doesn't deliver more power than the VCCSA does. Um, the voltage controller used here is actually not intercell. This is an international rectifier 35204. Um, this is a four phase part. It runs three plus one phases and any configuration up to that. It's not flexible like the, um, like the 69138, which incidentally the 69138, I forgot to mention this, can run 7 plus 0. Um, but yeah, anyway, back to the 35204. This thing runs 3 plus 1, and it's controlling this chip right here, which that's a international rectifier 3556. Uh, uh, that's a 50 amp power stage, and for VCC, uh, which I should have labeled that, VCCIO, um, you're going to be looking at about, again, 1.2 volts, you know, around 15 amps, and this will produce about 1.3 watts of heat, because again, this is a 50 amp part, uh, not a 40 amp part. So, yeah, and this has no heat sink, so it needs to be a bit more efficient than the one sharing it, you know, getting to share with the vCore VRM. Now then, moving on to the even more minor VRMs, the memory, um, which is this right here is the actual phase and the controller is all the way over here. Now these are intercell parts again, and this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. This, as you can probably guess by the way, based on what it looks like, yeah, that that's one of, uh, that's an ISL 99227B. I have no idea why EVGA decided to put these on memory power. It makes zero sense to me. It just like, 
because here's the thing, like you could make the argument, oh, bill of materials, they're already buying a bunch of these. Yes, but they're evidently buying a bunch of these as well, because these are doing VCCIO, right? If they used only these everywhere, I'd get it. But they have the 3556, that's a 50 amp part. This thing is a lot, lot cheaper. Um, they have the 3520204, which the voltage controller isn't a 69138. This is a, this is the 69138's little brother. This is the 69133, um, which is again X plus uh, X plus Y less than four this time. Um, so that's a four phase capable voltage controller, and it comes with the uh, where is it in my notes? Same switching frequency limitation as the as the uh, 69138, but. Yeah, that's, that's so, you know, they downgraded the voltage controller, but ultimately they're already buying 35204s and they're already buying 3556s. So I really don't know why they decided to put the 60 amp power stage onto memory power. Like, this is such a ridiculous overkill. Um, and it's a single phase as well, which uh, compared to, the, say, the, like, the core, like, the main competitors for this motherboard are the Rampage 6 Apex and the ASRock uh, OC Formula. And both of those use two-phase memory power, whereas this uses single phase. Um, the ASRock has a more powerful memory VRM, but, like, it doesn't matter. Like, it literally doesn't matter. DDR4 is, like, like two to four watts a stick, maybe. Um, really, it's around two watts most of the time. And when you really hammer the voltage, you might get to four volt, uh, to four watts if you're on, like, a dual rank stick with you know chips on like 16 chip memory stick um which would be dual rank and really crank up the volts you might hit that high power consumption figure but again it's just like it's nothing compared to any of the other things and then you get this ridiculous power stage here and i have no idea why it just makes zero sense to me then again asrock did basically the same thing on their oc formula where they have a two phase with like 40 amp uh, power blocks and it makes just as little sense to me as why the vrm is so powerful now rog uh you know asus rog decided that yeah we're doing a two phase but we're doing it with like really um like mosfets that are like um what would you say adequate for the job yeah that's one way to put it they're they're much much weaker mosfets than what evga or uh asrock opted for um, and they use they did a two phase design. So this is not as powerful as the OC formula. It's uh, stronger than what Asus has, but it's still ridiculous. Like even the Asus one is just overkill. Like this is DDR4. It doesn't pull any bloody power. And you do get one memory phase for each set of dim slots um, on either side of the CPU. So you get the same thing right here with the voltage controller there, and then the the phase is this part. Um, so, yeah, and ultimately, you know, you might think uh, compared to the OC formula and compared to the Rampage 6 Apex, this has less memory phases. This is going to be worse at memory overclocking. Well, it, again, DDR4 pulls so little power. It's a very low strain, like very low power strain device. So it doesn't actually matter how many phases you put on this ultimately what matters is the trace layout and the bios find like the the bios programming that's what really decides memory overclocking not how many phases you throw at the memory slots because the memory doesn't really use that much power um and that's why evga opted for you know that's why i guess evga decided that they're going to go with just one phase because it really doesn't matter i have one of these boards for for tech like i have a review sample of this board to test with and it's incredible like the the four memory slots that evga has opted for um they work they really really work like this board is beastly at ram overclocking on skylake x it's ridiculous so um, you know, as much as it would make sense to complain that this doesn't have two-phase memory power, um, I couldn't care less. This board is absolutely amazing at memory overclocking. EVG, like, EVGA no, evidently know what they were doing uh, when they de decided to, you know, not bother with uh, wasting board space on more, more phases that ultimately wouldn't do anything, uh, and instead went and uh, really, like, nailed the BIOS and uh, 
and uh, trace layout side of the of the memory uh, memory overclocking here because this thing's a beast. Um, Lumi, who's the number one f uh, overclocker in Finland, he's got this board to run 41, uh, 4120 megahertz on DDR4 at CL12, and I've gotten to 3950, and I'm very, very close to making 4000 working at CL12 as well. The last little VRM that is worth mentioning, kinda, uh, the VPP rail is con made by a fully integrated buck converter, which is a IR3899. Uh, um, and that's a 10 amp output part. But I don't know how much power VPP actually pulls. And this uh, VPP, uh, that's VPP DDR. Uh, and this is basically a supporting voltage for your memory sticks. It doesn't actually really do much. Um, as long as it's at 2.5 volts, your memory is going to overclock just fine. Um, you can't you can't actually change it on this motherboard if I yeah I don't think there's a BIOS setting even for this voltage which is fine like I don't see a problem with that this voltage never helped anything uh in all of my uh like with all the motherboards where I had access to that voltage it doesn't do a damn thing so it's just good that it's there and again plenty overkill because this is a supporting voltage that's main memory power this is just a, a minor rail for the memory so yeah, that's that's the VRMs on the VGAX299 Dark. It doesn't get better than this, um, literally. Um, there isn't any retail motherboards that I'm aware of that use better MOS. Like all the top X299 boards for in terms of VRM capabilities use the exact same componentry that the EVGA X299 Dark uses for VCC in. Like this 12 phase VCC in VRM, it's the same thing you would find on an OC formula. Uh, ASRock uses it on a few other boards. I think Gigabyte has basically the same VRM, but the EVGA Dark takes it a step, like EVGA's Dark here takes it a step further because they put the most ridiculous heat, like the VRM heatsink they have is amazing. It is just awesome. And uh, they've also gone ahead and tried to, like the gold plating is supposed to allow them to expose the ground plane um, for better, you know, heat dissipation from the PCB itself. But I think they're mostly using it as a gold trim to make the board look better, which it does. So, you know, can't really complain about that. And uh, yeah, so this is a beast of a motherboard, you know. It is absolutely a beast of a motherboard and huge props to EVGA for 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 making, you know, a motherboard that does truly compete with the Rampage 6 Apex and the OC Formula. And from my personal experience with the OC Formula and the X299 Dark, I like the Dark better. And we will go into more details on all of that in a separate video later because this is already long enough. So yeah, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment down below if you would like to support what we do here uh, at Gamers Nexus. Then there's a Patreon link uh, down below. There's also merch you can buy. And if you would like to see more uh, extreme overclocking related content, uh, I have a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking. And that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.